Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is a free man as of today. Opinions differ as to whether he should have been prosecuted. Judge Merchant partially lifted the gag order on President Trump. However, he admits that it wasn't what he intended. An election in Toronto, Canada has dealt a devastating blow to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. It was also a statement by Canadian voters about the left-leaning policies that have characterized Canada in the past few years. And the U.S. House of Representatives has passed a bill to force an end to the Chinese Communist Party's long-running campaign of persecution against the spiritual group Falun Gong. Okay, let's get into it. The U.S. House of Representatives has passed a bill to force an end to the Chinese Communist Party's, the CCP's, long-running campaign of persecution against the spiritual group Falun Gong. Representative Scott Perry introduced the bipartisan Falun Gong Protection Act with 18 co-sponsors. The bill was passed by voice vote on June 25th. This is the first U.S. legislative bill to advance through the chamber that addresses the CCP's brutal suppression of Falun Gong. Falun Gong is a meditation discipline that is based on the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. In 1999, the number of practitioners totaled up to 100 million, which outnumbered the total number of Communist Party members. Since 1999, Falun Gong has been the subject of a relentless campaign by the Communist Party of China. For the past 25 years, Falun Gong practitioners have faced lengthy imprisonment, torture, forced labor, and forced organ harvesting. The Falun Gong Protection Act, which still needs Senate approval, calls for an immediate end to the persecution. If signed into law, it will require the United States to avoid cooperating with China in the organ transplantation field. The bill will also require the United States to deploy targeted sanctions and visa restrictions in order to address the CCP's persecution of Falun Gong on the international stage. Representative Scott Perry said on the House floor on Tuesday that discussing systematic forced organ harvesting in 2024 is itself very frightening. He said, forced organ harvesting, a form of mass murder. This is something like we saw with Joseph Mengele, but it's happening today. In China, if you've got the money, there is no waiting list for you to get an organ. There is a ready supply of these organs. Representative Scott Perry described the bill as a first step by Congress to take strong legal action against the persecution of Falun Gong and against forced organ harvesting. After 25 years, Falun Gong has become the centerpiece of this legislation. The bill would also mandate sanctions on CCP officials, military leaders, and other individuals who are directly or indirectly involved in the involuntary harvesting of organs in China from practitioners who are still alive. The sanctions list prohibits individuals from entering the United States, from engaging in U.S.-based transactions, and it revokes their current visas. The bill also carries a civil penalty of up to $250,000 and a criminal penalty of $1 million and 20 years in prison for all offenders. According to the bill, the Secretary of State, the Health and Human Services Secretary, and the Director of the National Institute of Health should determine if the persecution of Falun Gong counts as an atrocity under the LEV Cell Genocide and Atrocities Prevention Act of 2018. They must also determine how much U.S. grant funding has been used to support organ transplants in China. The legislation's text reads, the widespread systematic state-sponsored persecution of the Falun Gong by the Chinese Communist Party leadership of the PRC constitutes a clear violation of Falun Gong practitioners' basic human rights and may constitute genocide. The bill was supported by lawmakers. Representative Greg Stanton focused on the unimaginable suffering the victims endure with their most basic rights stripped away, their bodies violated in the most grotesque manner. He said, imagine the terror and despair of those who are imprisoned for their beliefs 
only to have their organs forcibly taken from them. This is not just a statistic or a distant issue. These are real people, people with families, with dreams, who endure unbelievable pain and fear. Representative Rich McCormick also thanked Perry for introducing the bill. McCormick noted, the idea that a member of a religious minority could be targeted and killed so that their organs could be harvested is worthy of a horror movie. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange appeared in court on Wednesday in the U.S. Pacific Island Territory of Saipan Island, and he was released after pleading guilty to violating the U.S. Espionage Act. During the three-hour-long hearing, Assange pleaded guilty to one criminal count of conspiring to obtain and disclose classified U.S. defense documents. He said that he believed that the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which protects freedom of speech, protected his activities. He told the court, Working as a journalist, I encouraged my source to provide information that was said to be classified in order to publish that information. I believed the First Amendment protected that activity, but I accept that it was a violation of the espionage statute. In court, he stated he accepted the consequences of releasing classified information despite his belief that the U.S. Espionage Act contradicted the First Amendment. Chief U.S. District Judge Ramona V. Manglona accepted his plea and released him because Assange had already served his sentence in a British prison. Assange left Saipan on a private jet shortly after noon local time. He was accompanied by the Australian ambassador to the United States and the United Kingdom. They then flew to Canberra, the Australian capital. Assange's actions have been strongly supported by press freedom advocates. However, Washington argues that Assange's behavior went beyond journalism and whistleblowing and that his theft and indiscriminate release of classified documents endangered innocent lives. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese repeatedly had asked the U.S. to drop the charges against Assange. WikiLeaks said, this is the result of a global campaign that spanned grassroots organizers, press freedom campaigners, legislators, and leaders from across the political spectrum all the way to the United Nations. His U.S. lawyer Barry Pollack told reporters outside the court, We firmly believe that Mr. Assange never should have been charged under the Espionage Act and engaged in an exercise that journalists engage in every day. He said that WikiLeaks' work would continue. On Tuesday, Manhattan Judge Juan Merchant tweaked President Trump's gag order. Under the adjusted gag order, President Trump was allowed to comment on witnesses and jurors in the case publicly. That means that President Trump can once again speak out against key figures like former attorney Michael Cohen and adult film star Stormy Daniels. However, President Trump is still prohibited from discussing other people involved in the case until the official sentencing on July 11th. In his five-page decision, Judge Merchant explained that the original purpose of the gag order was to preserve the integrity of the judicial process. He wrote, Circumstances have now changed. The trial portion of these proceedings ended when the verdict was rendered and the jury discharged. However, the judge retained the order that prohibits President Trump and his legal team from disclosing personal information about the jurors, including identities, addresses, and places of employment. This was an order to ensure the safety of the jurors. President Trump's attorney Todd Blanche said after the verdict that the defense team had destroyed that information, but parts of the gag order still remain in effect. President Trump is still prohibited from commenting on court staff, the prosecutorial team, and their families until after the sentencing. Merchant emphasized that these individuals must perform their duties in an environment free from threats, intimidation, and harassment. However, President Trump is free to comment on the judge himself and Alvin Bragg, who is the district attorney in charge of the prosecution. President Trump's campaign spokesperson Stephen Chung called it another unlawful decision, and he announced that President Trump would immediately challenge the unconstitutional order. President Trump's legal team had previously asked for the gag order to be lifted entirely. They argued that continued restrictions of President Trump's free speech after the trial lacked justification. But the Manhattan District Attorney's Office asked Judge 
merchant to keep the gag order's ban on commenting on jurors in place until at least the July 11th sentencing. However, they did indicate last week that they have no objection to allowing President Trump to comment on witnesses after the trial is over. Judge Merchant said it was his strong preference to extend the order as it applies to jurors, but he ruled that the appellate court decision had upheld the original gag order which applied to the trial, and therefore the order must be terminated. The partial lifting of the gag order comes two days before the first presidential debate of the 2024 election cycle on Thursday. The hush money case is also expected to be a topic that President Trump will address in the debate. The federal special election in a central Toronto, Canada district came down on Monday. The results of the election was an earthquake in Canadian politics. St. Paul's is in downtown Toronto. It is one of the safest liberal ridings. It's been unchanged since 1993. Former MP and cabinet minister Carolyn Bennett had represented the constituency since 1997. She stepped down in January of this year. But Monday's election resulted in a victory for conservative candidate Don Stewart over liberal Leslie Church. Stewart received 42% of the vote while Church trailed with 40.5% support. Comparing the results of the previous elections, you can see why this one shocked the conservatives and the liberals. Liberals won the previous nine elections in the district by over 20 points each time. In the last election in 2021, the Liberal Party's Bennett won with a 24-point lead. In the previous 2019 election, she won by over 30 points. And in the 2011 election, when the Liberal Party was reduced to just 34 seats, Bennett still won by 8 points. According to CTV News, liberal insiders say that they didn't expect it to be that close and that they would lose. And conservative insiders said that they didn't expect to win. If the margin between Stewart and the liberal candidate was no more than five percentage points, they would have achieved their goal. For the conservatives, the party has not won a seat in this riding since the 1980s, nor has the party won a seat in urban Toronto since the 2011 federal election. The party's candidates this time were novices. Stewart is a marketing and finance professional. Church is an attorney and former chief of staff to federal treasurer Christia Freeland. Over the past few months, both candidates received help from party heavyweights, with the leaders of both parties personally campaigning for their candidates. Most political analysts went into the race assuming Church would win, but they warned that if she won by five points or less, it would still be a sign that Trudeau might lose in the next general election. However, the result was even more unfavorable to the Liberal Party than expected. People see this Liberal loss in this special election as a devastating blow to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and to the Liberal Party of Canada. Scott Reid, a one-time aide to former Prime Minister Paul Martin, said on X, this changes everything for the Liberals and for the Prime Minister. If St. Paul's is unsafe, there's no such thing as safe. According to the CBC's analysis of past election data, about 55 Liberal MPs won Ontario ridings in the last election, all with smaller margins than Bennett's St. Paul's win. So something similar could happen in other Ontario ridings. Dozens of Liberal members could lose their seats in the next election. The Canadian press warned. The race was considered a must-win for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and the loss is a massive blow that could trigger calls for him to step down after 11 years as Liberal leader. According to the CBC, during the campaign, voters in the riding expressed their dissatisfaction with the government's response to the housing crisis, inflation, and the way in which it had responded to the Hamas conflict. The Liberal Party of Canada, like left-wing parties in the U.S. and throughout Europe, had remained embarrassingly silent during the pro-Hamas demonstrations. Stewart, on the other hand, loudly declared that the repulsive acts of anti-Semitism should be unequivocally condemned by our leaders at all levels of government. Liberals who were interviewed by CTV complained that it was the deeply unpopular Trudeau who dragged Church down. 
When asked if that meant Trudeau should step down after 11 years as liberal leader, senior liberals who were interviewed by CTV said it was ultimately up to him. However, four liberal backbenchers who wished to remain anonymous expressed immediate concerns about the outcome. One of them said that they now fear losing seats throughout the greater Toronto area if Trudeau does not resign. Another said that the party shouldn't be surprised since the latest budget goes so far left. One MP suggests that it's time for Trudeau to go away, while another said that they think the party is drowning. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev posted on X on Tuesday morning urging the Prime Minister to call an early general election. He wrote, here's the verdict. Trudeau can't go on like this. He must call a carbon tax election now. In his own statement, Trudeau said, it was obviously not the result that liberals desired, but I want to be clear that I hear your concerns and frustrations. However, he has not made any statement on whether there will be an early general election or whether he will continue as party leader. CTV political commentator Scott Reed, on the other hand, recognizes that the trend and need for change is so obvious. The real question that the Prime Minister clearly needs to face is, what can he do to change the current trajectory? What's the alternative to resigning? Liberal sources mostly said that they were not ready to call on Trudeau to step aside just yet. But their position might change if Conservatives do well in the next few by-elections. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you. But please double-check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore on YouTube. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth.